Despite good conditions in the area, some yards were empty today at the Maitland sale. 250 trade cattle were to be auctioned, half the usual number, and only 50 export cattle where there are normally more than 300. The vendors are resisting the market a little with the uncertainty as to who's going to be in attendance, especially the export cattle. With the possibility that cattle won't be killed, buyers weren't encouraged to attend the sale. And without a good number of buyers to bid for the cattle, the farmers weren't keen to send their cattle in. Abattoirs at Scone and Curry are still in operation, so local trade cattle prices have been relatively unaffected. However, some agents fear the dispute will escalate and stop selling completely. At other centres throughout the state, prices for cattle, sheep and pigs have dropped and only producers who are short of feed are likely to sell. This afternoon, the 57-year-old yachtsman was very relieved as his 9-metre sloop was escorted by water police into Newcastle Harbour with only minimal damage. Only 12 hours earlier, he had narrowly escaped totally wrecking his boat. At dawn on Stockton Beach, fishermen who had been camped in the area north of the wreck of the Cigna awoke to this strange sight. We found a few things on the beach, but <laughs> not, not something like this. Lone Japanese sailor Hiroshi Hanasumi was sailing from Sydney to Coffs Harbour when at about 2am last night he realised he'd forgotten to activate his depth sounder. His yacht was in shallow water and he was in trouble. Big wave, uh, both uh, side punching, wake up, uh, I engine start, steering, but no wave, big wave, surfing. And then you're on the beach. Hiroshi, who has been sailing the world for the last three years, said he was incredibly lucky as the sloop rodeo was washed in through a channel and dropped onto the beach. Despite the language barrier, Hiroshi worked with Stockton and Nelson Bay Police to lever the bow of the boat towards the incoming tide and rodeo was slipped back into the ocean. Hiroshi plans to sail for Coffs Harbour tomorrow. Peter Ryan reporting for NBN News. Today, the Newcastle Mothers of Twins Club hosted the annual get-together for all twins in the Hunter. And that's when the fun began. Double the fun, that is. Some twins are identical and some are not. This set is identical, but believe it or not, this one isn't. When the kids get together, they don't do anything by halves, they do them all by twos. Where one twin goes, so does the other. You're just never sure if you're seeing double, ask the parents how to tell some twins apart, and they'll say it's so easy. One has hair much darker than the other. Call them duos, pairs, sets, doubles, twins, or just plain identical people. Whatever. It was a giant confusion. Perhaps it's all an optical illusion. Willie Lafitte for NBN News. In Professor Keith Morgan's eyes, he didn't deserve the harsh criticism dealt out to him by the staff and student associations yesterday. The two groups were upset at the structuring of a draft council to head the soon-to-be amalgamated Newcastle University, Hunter Institute of Higher Education and Conservatorium of Music. 
Reduced from 27 members to 16, the draft council included no general staff representation and only one student representative. The composition was decided on by Education Minister Dr Terry Metherill, but the student and staff bodies say Professor Morgan had held talks with the minister prior to that and had failed to represent their needs properly. Professor Morgan vehemently denies that, saying he'd stuck by them all along. My exchanges with the minister have been to make very positive statements in line with the policies which have been enunciated by the Senate and the Council of this university. These are policies to which I fully subscribe. Of accusations by the student and staff bodies that his representations to the minister had been hasty and inadequate, Professor Morgan was in agreement. He said that was simply because of Dr Metherill's timetable. But bitter Professor Morgan is not. He says he can understand the staff and students' frustrations and does not intend to go into battle against them, but rather will be lumping their grievances and his in the lap of the minister. We shall be replying strenuously and offering him advice on the le draft legislation and we shall insist that he responds to that advice and gives us the opportunity of further discussions if it becomes necessary. After holding the reigning Winfield Cup champions for most of the first half, the Knights line broke and Senator Darren McCarthy scored for the Bulldogs with 50 seconds left on the second quarter clock. That try right on half time signalled the opening of a scoring blitz as McCarthy scored again, barging over from dummy half. Terry Lamb backed up a brilliant break by fullback Darren Curry to score in the 54th minute and then a few moments later McCarthy grabbed his third try of the match to put the game out of reach to an out of touch Knights team. Coach Alan McMahon reflected on the fact that the Knights had met the Premiers at full strength, but he was pleased with the early effort. They really got away with us probably in the third, late in the third quarter, and, and um, with those two quick tries that they put, uh, they got they got right out of reach. But um, certainly up till half time, that um, you know we were very patient with them and they were patient with us, and they would probably just got a little bit us on the percentage game. And of course that scrum against the loose and the feet um, certainly tipped the scales in their favour. The Knights have come out of the Panasonic Cup match with some injuries which are bound to give the selectors a headache or two in the next 24 hours. I think Brian's definitely out. He, um, the doctor more or less indicated last night that he has done some damage to the medial ligament. Um, of course that'll be ascertained now while he's getting x-rayed and we'll know later the day. Uh, of course Mark, the doctor, seems to think that the bone's OK. However, he sent him for x-rays and we'll know more about that tonight as well. If Quinton is out, who will be the Knights' goal kicker on Sunday against Wests? Well, there's probably a few other options left open there too. As Peter Johnson's a goal kicker, and uh, Michael McKinnon's had a bit of it, and um, Jeff Doyle's had a bit of it, and they've been practicing here nearly every afternoon with our uh, kicking coaches, so uh, we'll have a look at that as well. Mr Rogers said today the proposal is designed to prop up ailing and inefficient health funds, subsidising them with the contributions of members of healthier funds. Under the change, currently before Health Minister Blewett, all people over 65 years of age would be labelled as chronically ill, or any person under 65 who spends more than 14 days in a hospital in any one year. Presently, the reinsurance scheme covers only those people who spend more than 35 days in a hospital. Last financial year, NIB members paid $4 million into the pool. That's 66 cents a week for every family. But under the new arrangements, this would double with no extra benefit going to the contributor. So who would benefit from the proposed change? The ones that are in favour obviously see some advantage being derived out of the pool. On the other hand, we're one of the net payers into the pool. And I might add that uh, we're not the only organisation opposed. There are many other uh, funds such as the HERMA funds, group of funds, some VHIAA funds, the Private Hospitals Association, the Australian Medical Association have all indicated their opposition and as late as Tuesday this week New South Wales Health Funds Association uh, indicated they rejected the proposals. The proposal is already with Health Minister Blewett and is expected to go before Federal Cabinet soon.
Waiting for Mr. Collins were hundreds of hospital cleaners, furious that the first they knew of Legionnaire's disease at the hospital was through the news media. They also feared that contract cleaners will replace them with further risk to public health. The aim of Mr. Collins' visit, accompanied by leading expert Dr. Peter Christopher, was to reassure the public that all possible safety measures were being taken. Dr. Christopher said that today it was discovered that the bacteria in the hospital's air conditioning system was the same as that which had infected the kidney transplant victim. Mr. Collins visited the patient and another female transplant patient who is being tested for Legionnaires. Two attempts at press conferences were thwarted, once by angry demonstrations by the members of the Health and Research Employees Union with 600 members in Newcastle. This is one of 13 air cooling towers at the hospital. The bacteria was found in two of them. The cleansing process began yesterday and isn't expected to be finished and finally tested until Monday. During Mr Collins' press conference right here, he was hurriedly rushed away and journalists and cameramen feared that there could be some risk of contamination. Nobody seemed quite sure and even now, just as I speak, we've been warned to film upwind of the cleaning process. But out of the confusion, it appears that stringent decontamination methods are being used and Dr Christopher said new guidelines will be even more thorough. It will certainly minimise the uh, Legionnaire's disease occurrences and it, we should certainly never have another epidemic such as the one in uh, Wollongong, in Adelaide, in Burnie uh, that have occurred in the past few years. Mr Collins said Legionella bacteria can be present all the time in air cooling systems. I really think it sends a, a timely reminder to everybody that they've got to be careful about maintenance of standards, cleaning standards. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, that's the purpose of my visit here today to first of all reassure the people of Newcastle that uh, steps have been taken, that Royal Newcastle Hospital has a clean bill of health, that it can get back to uh, its normal operating capacity after this 24-hour uh, suspension and uh, that it can go on providing the, the excellent service that it's provided for many years. The 550 mile trip takes fines over the Arctic wilderness. Now though, the sun has broken through and the brilliant white scenery is breathtaking. The next stop will be Ward Hunt Island, the last speck of Canada and the final home for his polar team. This once busy ice hamlet, which will become base camp, is uninviting and ghostly. It's the remains of an American research base built in the 60s and which will form the skeleton of fine shelter from the raw, freezing winds. On arrival, he immediately sets about transforming the site. Soon, despite the inhospitable elements, it becomes a relatively cosy den, where he and expedition partner Mike Stroud will spend their last few days before entering the ice pack. You can go very well one day and think, Christ, I'm going to make it. And then uh, the bad weather comes in and you just go sit out for two days. So it's totally unpredictable. Once the aircraft is unloaded, it prepares to leave. And once it departs, it's down to the two men's physical and mental strength and endeavor. For they are truly on their own.
I do understand your desire and the need, and uh, I think it would be good if, uh, if it can be done here. I appreciate what you said at the beginning, that you understand that the decisions have to be made on taking into account all national interest grounds, but I think you have a strong case. It'll be, uh, it'll be considered favourably. The dispute between the university and the government has grown out of the move to amalgamate the university and the Hunter Institute. That amalgamation is now virtually accepted by both organisations, but what is not accepted is draft legislation which significantly reduces the representation of academic staff, general staff and students on the council which will preside over the amalgamated institution. The increase in government appointees at the expense of representation from within the university has been condemned by the Staff Association, the Students' Association and the Convocation of the University. Today the Chancellor added the weight of her opinion to the fight against the government. The input from within the university and from the academics within the university is to be considerably reduced in the structure of the new council whereas the proportion of people nominated by government is to increase. The balance has changed in a way which I find quite unacceptable. A university should have preserved the autonomy of its own organisation. This is necessary to maintain standards. So is there real concern that Newcastle University could end up being run by bureaucrats from Macquarie Street? Well, that's a possibility, depending on who's appointed, and that's a risk not only for Newcastle University, but for other universities in New South Wales, as the same framework has been put forward for all universities, and I believe that they are all objecting as strongly as Newcastle. <laughs> Hunter Valley Mines rely heavily on rail to transport their coal to Newcastle. However, they have a less than happy working relationship with the SRA. The coal companies claim production methods at their mines are competitive, but that their viability is threatened by rail costs, which they claim are amongst the highest in the world. The State Rail Authority has always rejected the claims, saying it offers the best rates it can. Now the New South Wales Coal Association has stepped in in an attempt to settle the differences once and for all. With the cooperation of the SRA, the association soon begins a full examination of the coal freight workings. A committee which will report back at the end of April will recommend areas where costs can be reduced. According to Dr Barry Ritchie, Executive Director of the association, such an examination is overdue. It's a very big breakthrough in terms of improving relationships between the SRA and the industry, in terms of the industry understanding just what are the costs which the SRA is associated with and how we, the industry, might help to reduce those costs. Dr Ritchie was in Newcastle today to address the Newcastle Businessmen's Club on the direction of the coal mining industry. He says the future is brighter than it has been for some years but expects more jobs will go as mines modernise further. Yes, there will be some more restructuring in the industry, that's, that's inevitable. It will be good for the industry. It will provide a much more long-term, secure future for workers than there has been before. And we won't see, hopefully, the mine closures that have gone on over the last couple of years. Ambulance rescue and fire brigade worked to free the trapped man from the wreck at the corner of Ingle and Crebet streets. He was taken to Royal Newcastle Hospital with a suspected fractured leg and collarbone. The driver of the vehicle received minor lacerations to the arm and forehead and was taken to the Marta Hospital. Police allege his vehicle collided with a second car, then swerved and hit the telegraph pole. The driver and passenger of the other vehicle were also taken to hospital with minor injuries.
wouldn't be an Easter sporting event if it didn't rain and it fell in bucketfuls at the Cessnock course as players prepared for the start of arguably Australia's Premier Junior Golf Classic. The event is in its fifth year and growing in stature. Each state sends its best two juniors and they mix it with the pick of the youngsters from New South Wales. Patron of the tournament, Jack Newton, feels that events such as this are vital to the future of Australian golf. Uh, I see it as a very important part of the future of the game of golf in this country. The younger kids, uh, junior golf in this country is under 21. This particular tournament's all about kids under 18, which I think is the right age to start developing their future. This weekend, Dwayne Kerwin from Warhope will defend his crown and is considered by most to be the early favourite. Jack Newton looks to Tanya Hall of Western Australia and Sky Furno of New South Wales to be the best performed girls in the field. Play gets underway at 7am tomorrow. The Australian Championships are being held in conjunction with the state and combined high school titles. The regatta, which consists of an invitation race and four heats, is open to all classes. That's everything from a six-foot sabo to an Adams 10. Although there are four divisions, only a handicap separates the sailboards from the manor hulls. The winner of the championship will be determined by the number of points gained after four heats. They'll take home the title of Australian Secondary School Champion. Current holder of that title, Tony Jeffries, who also won the state and combined high school championships, is favourite going into the first heat tomorrow. However, if the perfect conditions of today's invitation race persist, then many talented and potential juniors could shine through. Rent for a house in Caves Beach is due to rise on April the 17th from $88 to $120. One in Windale will jump up from $82 to $105. Another in Wool's End will increase from $87 to $110. The idea is to bring public housing rents in line with the private sector in a bid to flush out high income earners. Pensioners and those on low incomes will not suffer, stresses Warren Kelly, regional housing manager. Well, we are sending letters to the uh, 1,500 in Newcastle at the moment who are not currently in receipt of rental rebates. They will also be given a rental rebate application in the letter. Now, if they feel that they're entitled to a reduction under the new arrangements, they are to apply, they should apply, and if they don't apply, they'll be expected to pay the new rate of rental. But out of the 7,100 tenants, 1,500 will see their rents hike up, and they are concerned. I have to pay it whether I like it or not. It's either that or move out, and who can afford the rental market these days? And I mean, I can't afford to buy a place, so I have to suffer it and just pay it. So how much will your rent be going up by? Uh, 42 a fortnight. So it's, it's 138 now, and it'll be going up to 180 a fortnight. At the moment, Newcastle and Lake Macquarie has its longest ever waiting list, with 4,500 people waiting up to five years for subsidised housing. Mr Kelly says public housing tenants are being encouraged to move out and buy their own homes with the aid of the state government's home fund to make way for new tenants. And the money raised by higher rents will go towards new housing. A problem with means testing could occur in families with working children. The children could be discouraged from seeking work altogether or the major wage earner could be stopped from seeking a job with higher wages for fear of penalising their rental payments. Rebecca Skinner reporting for NBN News.